Ah, memories. No one can ever take your memories from you. Each day is a new beginning. Make good memories every day. But is that true? Can anyone take our memories from us? Can anyone replace them? Such is the theme of the first of tonight's stories, a fantastic tale from Richard Saxon. So my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. No matter what you see in the coming months, regardless of how convincing it might seem, just know that I didn't want to die. I'm going to take all possible steps to prevent my predetermined demise, but well, if I don't make it, I need at least someone to know what really happened to me. I'm not, nor have I ever been, a remarkable person. I've never been terrible, but never did great deeds either. To put it bluntly, ever since I left high school, I found my place in eternal mediocrity. Honestly, being perfectly average didn't bother me much while growing up. Life was decent, I didn't struggle, and it felt like I had an overabundance of time to improve myself. But, <laughs> once I entered my thirties, the time I'd wasted started to wear on my confidence, and a bout of anxiety invaded my otherwise peaceful existence. In order to make myself feel better, I decided to look through my old home videos, figuring that maybe I could get an inkling as to where I lost my passion for living. I dug through my parents' basement while they were at the market to look for the long-since-forgotten memories. We hadn't filmed anything since the death of VHS tapes back in the early 2000s, but, well, with some luck, the infinite procrastination abilities possessed by my father meant that both the tapes and the player still waited idly by in the dust-covered boxes. After a long search, and a couple of coughing fits from the dust clouds, I found a box marked Home Videos. The box was full to the brim with old tapes, and the player itself. It was far more than I ever remembered filming, but it had already started to satisfy my hunger for nostalgia. I felt confident that I'd find at least some inspiration, and drive, within the films. So, with little hesitation, I eagerly brought them home to my one-bedroom apartment, and connected the old player, using a ton of adapters to make it fit modern televisions. I picked up the first tape, labelled Adam Davis Highlights, 1985-2006, to and inserted it into the player. Though some of the footage was more than three decades old at that point, the tape itself was rather new, or at least as new as VHS tapes could possibly be. It meant that someone had transferred the footage to a newer tape to preserve the film, probably my mother. It had to be rewound, and as it did, I bought myself a glass of cheap whiskey while listening to the loud whirring sound of the tape being dragged back to its beginning. And then I hit play. A poorly focused picture came to view partially covered by the date, reading January 5th, 1985. It was myself as a baby, barely out from the womb, and my mother was the person behind the camera. She cooed and made funny hand gestures to get me to smile, which I diligently did as she laughed in joy at her wrinkly little creation. I sat through half an hour of footage, watching myself grow up, and though I had no recollection of these events, it felt nice to see that I once lived a carefree life of joy and exploration. Everything felt amazing, and before I knew it, Christmas of 1989 had rolled around, one of my very first happy memories. Four years old and wearing an oversized Santa hat, I sat on our carpeted floor and fiddled with a colourfully wrapped Christmas gift. Cheerful music played in the background, and a dog ran around, excited by the torn wrapping paper littering the floor. The dog eventually ran over to my young self and started to playfully pull on my present while I attempted to push it away, all the while laughing my heart out. Oh, it was a wonderful scene to behold, and though I had a vague memory of that day, my first Christmas to remember, I had absolutely no recollection of ever owning a dog. Oh, don't get me wrong, I love dogs. In fact, I always wanted one, but... Due to horrible allergies that developed during my childhood, my parents always kept me away from the furry and lovable creatures. 
My first thought was that the dog belonged to some other family member. But as the years went by, the dog proved a faithful companion and made several appearances on the tape. Though the footage was clearly real, and I was the centre of it, I couldn't for the life of me remember the dog. He, Doug, followed me around until the age of twelve, when it suddenly stopped showing up on the tape. Presumably passed away from old age, but he wasn't discussed any further in any of the other clips. He kept watching through my primary school years, then high school, and finally college. Everything was exactly how I remembered it, every minute detail matching my memory of life. Everything except for the dog. As the tape neared its end, the date read October 7th, 2006. I was filming myself out with some colleagues from my part-time job. We were just having a few drinks after work, and though it wasn't a particularly exciting evening, I remember feeling so happy, absolutely certain of my place in the world. Everyone was laughing, and we seemed to have a genuinely great time. The evening went on, and my memory turned hazy while the footage turned more sloppy. As it often goes with an overabundance of alcohol, there were holes in my memory from that night. The screen cut to black for a few seconds, and once the picture returned, someone was filming me from the other side of the bar. Whoever held the camera, they weren't one of my friends, nor did I seem to pay them any attention. On the footage, I still sat with a couple of my colleagues at the table, just finishing up my final beer before getting up to pay the tab. As we left the bar, the cameraman followed us, keeping his distance. We still didn't acknowledge his presence. Unbeknownst to us, a stranger had gotten hold of my camera, and in my drunken state I never realised. He kept following us down the street as my friends dropped me off into a taxi. The clip ended, and the screen cut to black for a full minute. I wondered if the tape had reached its end, but the timer kept counting up. Once the picture returned, I was met by a dark scene. The camera was pointed towards a dimly lit road and slowly panned along the street. Small pieces of debris and chunks of cloth littered the road, all accompanied by a vague crackling sound in the distance. Before long, the picture showed a mangled car wreck partially on fire. The cameraman moved closer to the wreck. I gasped in shock as I saw the severity of the crash. The driver's head had been smashed beyond recognition by the steering wheel. He'd suffered a quick, unexpected death. But the passenger, I, was still alive. It zoomed in on my mangled body as I desperately tried to get free from my seat. But I was stuck under twisted metal and my broken legs had been caught within it. The fire spread slowly at first and the cameraman stood idly by watching as it reached my body. Still, I didn't notice anyone filming me. The fire started to spread quicker, and I screamed in agony as it climbed up my body towards my face, my clothes fusing to my skin and my face charring from the heat. After the fire had burned away most of my skin, killing each of the nerve endings, I stopped screaming, though I never stopped moving. Not until my muscles had finally stopped functioning did I finally go quiet. I'm not sure how long the scene lasted, nor do I care to go back and check. I sat frozen in fear as I listened to each second of my pleading screams until the moment I fell silent and finally died. My life had ended. On camera, the 7th of October, 2006. That was just the end of the first tape. I sat speechless trying to figure out if I'd fallen victim to some sick prank, or if the footage showed an alternate version of myself that never made it out of college. I dug out another tape and read the title. Adam Davis, Highlights, 1985-2002 to With extreme trepidation, I removed the first tape and inserted the second into the player. Be it morbid curiosity, or a desperate need to find answers, I decided to watch another. 
The footage was almost identical to the first tape, but no dog ever showed up in the film. Instead, the only notable change to my life was the fact that my grandfather had died in 1999, instead of 1993, and the colour of my first car changed from black to red. I kept forwarding to the very end of the tape, only watching bits of clips along the way. Once at the end, the day was dated November 15th, 2002. It was a party, and though too young to legally drink, it hadn't stopped me from enjoying the occasional house party. I remember leaving the place around midnight after being rejected by my crush and walked the two-mile journey home alone in the dark. As I walked, someone followed me in the distance, filming me without my knowledge, just as with the first day. I crossed the street and took a shortcut through an alleyway, and was immediately cut off by a hooded figure. The scene was filmed from too far away to hear what was happening, but the hooded person pulled a gun, and I lifted my hands up in response and immediately froze. Whether it was supposed to be a robbery or a hostage situation, I didn't know. I just kept holding my hands up high while the robber erratically waved the gun around. Before I could defuse the situation, the gun went off and hit me point blank in the throat. I fell to the ground, clutching my throat. While I lay there, desperately trying to slow down the bleeding, the cameraman approached me with slow, patient steps. This time I noticed the stranger approaching, and I stared into the camera as I gasped for air, unable to call out for help. It took me less than a minute to bleed to death, the camera continuously getting closer to my panicked face until the moment I took my last gargled breath, and then it cut to black. In 2002, I died alone on the streets, never knowing why. The same scene kept repeating itself for each of the recordings. Every time, small details were changed. Memories that didn't make sense. Things that didn't happen. But they always ended with my untimely death. On September 29th, 2004, I drowned as my car plunged into the river. The windows didn't open and I couldn't break through the windshield. On January 13th, 2005, I fell off a cliff and broke my legs while hiking alone in a neighbouring city. The fall caused an open fracture which severed one of my arteries, and it took me a full hour to bleed out as I desperately tried to crawl for help. Five deaths, each filmed by a stranger, never offering a helping hand, never speaking a single word. I returned to my parents' place with the box of tapes and demanded to know what the hell was going on. They took one glance at them and denied knowing about their existence. Despite my father's extreme laziness, he'd long since gotten around to digitalizing the footage, putting it on a hard drive and storing it in a fireproof safe. They showed me the home videos they'd made, and everything appeared just as I remembered it, with no horrific death at the end. The tapes had to have been put in the basement recently, as a flood had destroyed most of the stuff stored there only a year before when I was abroad. Whoever put the videos there, it wasn't my father. Following the conversation with my parents, my first instinct was to throw the tapes in a fiery pit and forget they'd ever existed. But saner thoughts prevailed. I had to talk to the police, to figure out who had made them and, more importantly, how. I loaded them into my car, checking over each of the titles once more, when I noticed one marked Highlights, 1985-2020. to 2020. I stopped dead in my tracks and just stared at the tape in my hand. It was bizarre enough to hold a cassette dated in the future, but the fact that I already knew its ending horrified me even further. After what felt like an eternity of contemplation, I decided to see what the tape had to offer, a glimpse into my near future, for better or for worse. If it revealed any details, maybe I'd get the chance to escape whatever fate had in store for me. 
I stared intently at each memory depicted on the television screen, desperate to look for any deviations from my own memory. If I was lucky, it was another reality altogether. But no matter how hard I tried to look for any discrepancies, it perfectly matched my life as I knew it. Once the tape got to December 2019, I took a deep breath and paused the video for a moment. Maybe I should have let the police deal with it. If fate is predetermined, then how could I even prevent it? But I had to know what would happen to me. The urge was irresistible. I hit play once more. The date read December 17th, 2019 and the picture revealed a cold, grey hospital room. I was there, holding my unconscious mother's hand as she took her last breath and fell eerily silent, as if her presence had left the world. The doctor in the room assured me she hadn't felt any pain, that she was at peace, but the actual cause of her death never came up. Whoever filmed it didn't seem to take part in the interaction, just like with the other clips. The stranger simply observed us, unnoticed by anyone actually in the room. The clip ended rather abruptly, cutting to black, remaining empty for a full minute. Once it faded back in, the date read January 24th, 2020. I saw myself sitting in what looked like a dirty motel room, one I couldn't recognize. I kept my hands folded over my lap as I sat on the edge of the bed. I was clearly distressed and paid little notice to the cameraman in the room. It went on like that for a couple of minutes, me muttering some incomprehensible panic sentences and the camera remaining focused on my hands. Suddenly, I lifted my head towards the cameraman with pleading eyes. Please, I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this. I don't want to. I don't want to. I said with a trembling voice. The cameraman remained silent, but the look on my face said enough. I was horrified, and it was clear that whoever filmed me was also coercing me to do something against my will. I lifted my hands up from my lap to reveal a knife. Just the run-of-the-mill pocket knife, but threatening nonetheless. My hands shook as I once more begged for mercy. I don't want to, please, don't make me do this. Then I directed my attention to the knife, and without hesitating any further, I plunged it into my wrist, dragging it up along my arm towards my elbow as I winced in agony. I sat motionless on the bed as viscous blood poured from the cut, the camera keeping its focus on me as the life slowly drained from my body. Minutes passed, and I dropped dead on the floor, letting out a final breath before succumbing to blood loss. The tape ended with the familiar jagged lines and grey screen, with a high-pitched, monotonous beep the only thing left to keep me company. Following the last tape, I headed straight to the police station and handed over the tapes. They were hesitant at first, but quickly came around when they saw the footage. Of course, their explanation was more within the realm of logical possibilities that someone had altered the footage and created a doctored video though they did take it seriously as a threat to my life and swore they'd keep me safe while they looked into it. Unfortunately, without a perpetrator, it would be hard to do anything. I was left with little choice but to hide in my home with all the doors locked and every window covered up. After getting home, I sat myself down by the phone and waited for the police to call me with any updates, though I knew if anything did come up, it would take days, if not weeks. It's possible that it is another reality, and that'll be fine. Maybe it is just a sick prank, and not someone that can literally see into the future. Ah, well, those are all just hopeless thoughts. Because an hour ago, I received a phone call from my dad. He told me that my mum collapsed in the bathroom, and that they're taking her to the hospital. He keeps reassuring me that she'll be fine. But I know better. In a few weeks, my mom will be dead. And then shortly after, I'll follow.
And so now we move on to tonight's second tale, a tale of retribution. They say the noblest kind of retribution is not to become like your enemy. Not as easy as it may seem. Once again, sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. The hours seemed to drag tonight, he mused as he walked numbly but deliberately along the city streets. Most nights, the time flew by quickly on dark wings of some swift and avenging nocturnal predator. A fitting analogy, he noted, comparing speed to something akin to himself and his kind. But this evening was different. The city, its inhabitants, and indeed the very buildings and trees seemed to be locked in a sort of suspended animation, as if captured in a photograph. Nothing moved for miles, and still he trudged on. He could sense no sign of life and wondered if his usually keen senses had lost their edge. Worse yet, were they right? He was hungry and desperate. Unlike most of his kind, he was blessed, or perhaps cursed, with the ability to transform himself into other beings, both human and animal, with ease. He could pass for an attractive man, or even transform himself into a very convincing facsimile of a dog or a cat in order to properly get nourishment. In addition to this, he could become invisible. Big deal, he thought. What good did all those things do if no one accepts you? He drew his cloak around him. Not that he really needed a cloak. With his shape-shifting abilities, he was able to withstand cold, heat, and any other conditions thrown in his direction by the forces of nature. What he could not tolerate, however, was the separation and ostracision of the other vampires. Since his entrance into the realm of the undead, it had been decided by the High Council that he be given the ability to shapeshift. But he often wondered why he was counted among those favoured few who possessed this strange and coveted trait. He kept his questions to himself, though, for the ways of the council were never to be doubted or questioned in any way, and he had been chosen. So he accepted that gift, along with his immortality, and he used it. The council, of course, were adamant in the adherence to the ancient traditions and strict rules of transfiguration. Only certain forms of animal, other than human, were allowed. For one thing, he could only assume the shape of a predatory animal. Very rarely a reptile, and never a bird or a fish. In addition to that, the animal must always bear large teeth, long canines which were meant to rip and tear the flesh of victims, rather than simply making neat little inconspicuous holes in the necks of the unfortunate prey. Once long ago, on a journey in the jungles of Central America. He had brought the natives' legends of the fabled Chupacabra, or Goat Sucker, into terrifying reality. True, it enabled him to snare prey more easily than he'd ever known. Huh? Yes, it did give him the advantage of human superstitions and irrational fears, but in the end, he was sorry. Word of his transgression reached the High Council. He was therefore summoned to stand trial before them for breaking the ancient laws concerning shape-shifting. He was sure he'd done nothing wrong, or out of the ordinary. However, the council strongly disagreed. Our laws and rules state clearly that no shapeshifter must ever assume the form of anything fabricated in the minds of humans. The goat sucker is every bit a fantasy figure, as the dragon, mermaid, or any other thing of legends and fairy tales. They expounded on that taboo, saying that fantasy creatures brought into this world would draw much unwanted attention and make humans aware of a once invisible threat. Realistic animals, dangerous as they may be, were more or less commonplace. But real animals such as a bear or a wolf could draw a considerable amount of attention, especially when a series of attacks sharpened people's interest as well as fear. Several years back, he had stalked the areas of Northern California in the form of a mountain lion, making his way into populated areas, attacking and killing many people. When the park rangers, as well as the police and the media, took special notice of these mysterious mountain lion attacks, he knew he needed to disappear soon, 
and find new hunting territory, for he himself was in danger of being caught. His punishment? Ostracism from all his peers, even his beloved mentor and maker. He would know now what it was like to be truly alone. Before he was made, he had read where some primitive peoples of various world cultures would banish a member of a tribe if he or she had broken taboo. That person would be considered dead by family, friends, and all who knew him or her. Loneliness would soon sap all will to live from the banished one's heart and mind, and suicide by auto-suggestion would occur. That would not happen in his case, he told himself repeatedly. His will to live was far too strong. Besides this, he concluded in his own mind that the ugly green of jealousy had coloured the decision of those who bore witness against him at the trial. No one, not even the High Council, had the right to limit his darkness-given talent. He would prove the victor, despite his circumstances. But first, he must satisfy his hunger. Tonight, though, that would prove a somewhat difficult task. It seemed his usual victims were scarce. Perhaps it was time to try a new approach, maybe even a new source of food. He sniffed the air. He listened for signs of life. His reflective eyes pierced through the fog, trying to see anything new. His empty veins burned. He continued on his way. On this particular night, he hunted in the guise of a man. It had not been the first time, and more often than not, he had been successful. In his human persona, he exhibited an intense, hypnotic charisma, combined with raw sex appeal which drew his victims to him with little or no effort at all. As well, this was the easiest way to pass through cities and towns inconspicuously. He also had the option of going place to place unseen via his invisibility method, but he rarely used that. It was an exhausting process which left him little strength to hunt and feed. As for animals, he saved those forms for roaming the rural and more sparsely populated areas. Then, on the cool pre-dawn breeze, he sensed it. Prey. Off in the distance, he could hear a woman's voice. Another voice answered it. Two women. Hmm. Now things would start happening for him. If he thought at least one of them beautiful, he'd remake her into a creature like himself. If he found both of them attractive, all the better. Yet he could never pass on the gift of shape-shifting. That talent was bestowed upon him alone. But at least he assured himself a companion in the long, dark years of immortality. He would not be lonely, and she would live forever at his side, looking upon him as maker, hero, champion, and lover. Moreover, she would know nothing of how he came to be shamed and excluded. She would know what he needed her to know, and that was it, he told himself. He started off in the direction of the two female voices. Well, it was necessary. The first spoke emphatically. An example had to be made, and we... Her voice trailed off at the sound of muffled footsteps. What was she talking about? No matter. He was ready to satisfy himself, and mere words should never distract him. He approached. Both women turned. The woman who spoke was of medium height with long, dark, wavy brown hair. Her posture was straight, and she didn't seem to be the type that would startle easily. In fact, her demeanor was calm, assertive, and full of practical purpose. Her dark blue eyes met his pale ones. She didn't greet him, or was even the least bit surprised that he was there. It was as if she were expecting him to come to her at this particular place at this particular time. Her companion was different, however, and at the sight of the stranger she gasped and gave a sharp little cry. 
She was a petite little thing, with strawberry blonde hair which had been cut and teased into a sort of faux, wind-blown look which suited her pointed little chin and big, weepy, wet green eyes. She was not only startled, but visibly frightened. She reminded him of a nervous bird, ready for flight at a moment's notice. She was right to feel some measure of awe. Here was a man of rather ordinary appearance, yet beneath the surface the intense magnetism was about to emerge like a serpent uncoiling itself from a tree. Already there was tension in the air. His human persona was handsome, but not in the polished, Hollywood leading man sort. There was a starkness and ferocity about him, not to mention the slightly shabby clothes he wore. His face was angular and pale, and his eyes were a soft mist grey which could harden into steel, charcoal, or even black when provoked to attack. For now, they remained soft and misty, reflecting light much the way cat's eyes do. The hair was dark and hung about his head and shoulders wildly, as if it had never been touched by brush or comb, and he strode towards them the way a wolf does when encountering its next meal. His hands were large and bony with long fingernails, which more accurately resembled claws or talons than human fingernails, despite the flesh covering those hands being white, clean, and deceptively silky soft. Yes, even as a man, much of him remained a beast. The brunette smiled when he reached them. She seemed inexplicably pleased to see him, and he wondered if they'd ever met. He couldn't help noticing just how attractive she was with her tall, slim form and luxurious hair. She might make a fit companion for him after all. His hand slackened around the edges of his cloak. Deep in the mountains, in an almost forgotten part of the world, the council had assembled itself. At a massive table in the great hall of the castle, twelve figures discussed at length the transgressions and broken rules of the animal shapeshifter among their kind. He seemed to learn nothing from his punishments. Banishment only made him penitent for a short while, and his will to live was kept afire by pure defiance. What could be done about this? They were stymied for a solution, but certainly not at a loss for words. He's gotten just what he deserved snapped a tall, black-haired woman seated along the left-hand side of the table. Her long nails drummed noisily on the dark wood. It's just what the council ought to have done in the first place. Has he? drawled a voice next to her. Or are you simply jealous because you weren't chosen for such an honour? The speaker turned his angular features toward the dark beauty. She did not flinch, but looked past him to address the head of the council. You yourself know what he did was against everything our kind adheres to. He brought this on himself for abusing his power. Her dark eyes flashed in her austere, beautiful face. Why not send someone to take care of this lawbreaker once and for all? Perhaps, began a wheezy voice further down the table. It is because he is, or rather was, young when he was made. Youth does tend to be irresponsible with powers. That has no bearing whatsoever, intoned a deep voice figure whose hand bore a rather ornate ruby ring. Young or old, those who have lived millennia or centuries, all must obey the laws set down for us by the council. Oh, really? snarled a young, slim female, dressed in black leather. She brushed aside a wisp of honey-blonde hair from her left eye. And just what makes you so quick to judge? I mean, after all, we're all trying to go our own way and get what we can. Who said anything about rules, anyway? Are you on his side? drawled the man next to the dark woman. He set his small ice-blue eyes upon her. His gaze was steady and chilling. What if I am? she snorted defiantly. You are all so damned high and mighty. We were never meant to follow rules. Those are for the mortals, not us. They follow rules, 
the deep-voiced bearer of the ring went on in his deep, sonorous voice. So must we. A lion must learn the habits and behavior of wildebeest and buffalo. So must we. We need to be as cautious and clever as the humans are, and more. We can't risk scaring them off or exposing ourselves. That would be disastrous. He rose from his place at the head of the table and raised a big, bony hand. From his black velvet robe, he seemed to produce, as if by magic, a long scepter, at whose end was a solid gold skull adorned with rubies and sapphires. He bound it three times on the table, and the council fell into respectful silence. The twelve members of the council all looked up simultaneously into his skull-like face, peering out of a purple-lined black hood. They waited. For centuries, we have abided by the laws set down to us by our ancestors, and in that time few rules have been broken. Those who have been so foolish or arrogant have suffered the consequences. That has always been a part of our plan. The shapeshifter must take his punishment and be made an example. What he did was unacceptable, and thus... I've sent the appropriate one to execute the correct punishment. There was some scattered applause at the table, and a triumphant expression on the statuesque face of the beautiful dark woman. The serpentine man with the ice blue eyes and sarcastic drawl simply tented his long hands together and stared at his own skeletal fingers. The wheezy voiced man coughed noisily into a silk handkerchief. The blonde simply stared at the council leader with undisguised hatred. Once again, the butt of the scepter was struck three times, staccato fashion on the dark table. The bony, ruby-ringed hand commanded silence. Again, he spoke. I wish to call the maker of the shapeshifter to account, he said, as a pained look crossed his face momentarily. To everyone's surprise, up rose a tall, statuesque figure in crimson velvet. The beautiful, black-haired woman strode purposefully to the end of the table. But now, all smugness had vanished from her face. She too looked pained and hideously ashamed of what she had created. She turned to face the others. She glanced around. After what seemed like an eternity, she began. When he was first created, I had no idea he would be so rebellious. Perhaps I was the one at fault for putting the idea of shape-shifting into his head. But in my own way, I sense he had potential to be unique and as skillful as one of our kinds, and I also knew that animals possessed certain attributes which humans did not. I wanted him to have those attributes, so I petitioned the High Council to bestow these gifts upon him, and I was proud of him. I was as proud of him as a mother is of a son, or a wife is of her husband. And yes, she addressed the serpentine man, I was jealous. Hot tears welled in her eyes. I wanted to be those animals in every way, but I knew I was not destined or chosen for shapeshifting. So the next best choice was to see someone close to me given those gifts. And so I lived, to use the term loosely, vicariously through my latest creation. The young man had been wounded by a wild animal in the woods by his home and taken to the nearest hospital, and I was there, unknown to the mortal doctors and nurses in the hospital. So I saw the opportunity and I took full advantage. The young man lived, but not in the normal way that they'd all expected. He developed animalistic tendencies, and more tests were done. A few doctors had even suggested that he had contracted rabies, but I knew otherwise. He was becoming what I had always wanted to be. The first night I glimpsed him in his mountain lion form, I was moved to tears. It was magnificent. Her voice broke slightly, and she stopped to wipe her eyes with a handkerchief. At this, the blonde girl rose up and cried. So... You don't exactly have the moral ground to... Silence, the rope leader roared. I must have order. She will be allowed to speak. 
As time passed, she continued, he began asking questions about his abilities. Once he studied every animal he was allowed to emulate, he began to experiment with ones of mythical nature, such as that cursed goat sucker from Central America. I was never more humiliated. Drawing attention to mythical creatures such as this one would no doubt inspire suspicion in the human's belief that we too exist and are every bit as real as they are. Most of our societal camouflage has come from the fact that mortals see us as little more than legends, the stuff of their horror genre of film or literature. We've hidden behind that lie for centuries. If they do not believe, then they are not aware of us, and thus are easy prey for us. Awareness of us is, in itself, a defense against us. Because of my own vanity, I assumed that my creation would obey me and the rules that I followed. He did not. I hadn't taken into account the notion of free will or individual pursuits. So he was punished by ostracism. No one would have anything to do with him after that. But he survived, and I wished he hadn't. I regretted the moment I ever laid eyes on him. I wanted him punished, but I didn't know how. Very much like a parent who is forever marred by the offspring's misdeeds, I was only too glad to be separated from him permanently. For years, I have denied ever knowing him. I hid in a place in the northern mountains, hoping every once in a while to hear the news of his death. Yet I never heard anything about him being alive either. She paused. Well, until just a short while ago. Ah, yes. The leader's white face stared pensively down at the ruby ring on his bony finger. Ah, that was when the reports about the mountain lion attack were all over the humans' media. That's correct, she nodded. I knew his signature animal and killing style to be that of the North American mountain lion, or puma. I managed to travel halfway around the world and... There he was. Very shortly after that, he started assuming a human disguise. That was a wise move on his part, for the mountain lion was beginning to bring much unwanted attention. The last few nights, I have followed his every step, and now I can see that your method of punishment is appropriate. Do what you need to do. She nodded respectfully, and he motioned for her to be seated. The collective stare shifted from her downcast face back to that of the stern leader. Then their thoughts turned slowly to the shapeshifter and his whereabouts. They knew his time was drawing to an end. Back on his own familiar territory, the transgressor regarded his intended victims, unaware of the other's judgment and inevitable punishment. He continued to walk toward the two women, his lips drawn back in a feral grin. She said nothing, but continued to stare back at him as if to say, Here I am, I'm all yours. He stopped. Then some shade of recognition passed over his face. Then he stopped and a jolt of fear passed through him as he saw his intended victim. Something was wrong. But what was it? It was as if an alarm had gone off, warning him of impending danger. She, however, remained rooted to her spot, as he took a hesitant step in her direction. One thought burned in his mind at that moment. Never allow fear or any other emotion to distract you. The powerful must always remain in control. Never forget that you and your kind are the supreme ruler. He didn't see what came next. In one flash, a swift, snarling, clawing form was upon him, tossing him to the ground like a rag doll. He looked directly up into the yellow eyes of a raging mountain lion. But how? He was then aware of a searing, slicing pain as the animal's claws tore through him. In his weakened state, he then saw the face of the beast change slowly into that of the strawberry blonde. How ironic, he mused, drawing his last breath, that he be defeated by another shapeshifter like himself. How strange that someone like that should find him 
tonight of all nights. His captor once again morphed easily into her animal form, and with her canine teeth, grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and severed his spine. Above them, the sky became pale as the stars winked out. Soon, they would be here, and they would need to leave quickly. The transgressor's body could not be disposed of just yet. They would need to bring it back for confirmation to the council that everything had gone as planned, and that everything had run according to plan. The brown-haired woman bent over the body just as the sun rose and drew out a silver knife. With grim efficiency, she plunged it deep into the chest of the errant shapeshifter and pierced his heart. The other woman joined her in human form, and they spoke quickly about returning to the mountains to notify the council that their task had been done. The next moment, the women noticed a dark shape approach them from behind. Then two shapes. The first one was tall and powerful, and moved in his black and purple robes with great strides. The other stood just as tall, in red velvet but her gait was much more sinuous. The gold scepter the black robe figure carried glinted in the early sunlight. The ruby on his big, powerful hand shone through the mist like a freshly opened wound. The face of the figure in red was downcast and hidden beneath abundant black hair. The strangers approached the two women. Well done, proclaimed the leader, as he walked along the length of the transgressor's broken body, inspecting it as if it were a freshly tidied room or finished work of art. I must admit, you were the right one for this assignment. He turned his skeletal face in the direction of the strawberry blonde. It makes sense that you did the ultimate honours, my dear. His large mouth grinned, displaying rows of large, pristine, white, dagger-like teeth. He regarded the body again. This is what comes of disobedience. An example has been made. He went back to the statuesque figure in red velvet and whispered something in her ear. When she made no move to approach the body, he took her by the arm and led her down where the distorted remains of her creation lay. She did not cry, neither did she show any anger or remorse. Her chiseled white face wore a look of dead, cold indifference. We must burn the body, she spoke in a low voice. But not here. It must be taken to the palace in the mountains, and a pyre must be made, and all of our kind must view it and learn from this man's, this beast's errant ways. Disobedience cannot be looked upon lightly. The leader raised his scepter, and the two other women nodded in agreement. The following night, as expected, many had gathered outside the palace grounds and kindling was piled high in preparation for the burning of the shapeshifter. As others of his kind watched, all who knew him mused over what he had done and reflected their own opinions of the matter. There are those who felt, as the council had, that his punishment was just, while others truly sympathized with his plight and praised his radical rule-breaking ways as courageous and imaginative. Still, others were uncertain as to what they thought, but all who had been there could have sworn that they heard the snarl of a mountain lion as the last of the funeral fire burned down. So a couple of tales for you this evening, uh, both very, very different, but two that I just really liked and wanted to read for you. Is that okay? <laughs> I do so hope it is. Well, um, that's pretty much enough for one evening, don't you think? You want more? Oh my god, I was only with you last night. Did you listen to my tale from the Sunday evening? Uh, a weird and wonderful one about the Syrian civil war. Well, not really, was it? <laughs> anyway, um, if you missed that one, because I don't always pop, you know, I don't always do something on Sunday, go and check it out. It's a really weird and wonderful one. But that is enough for me for this evening. But of course, of course, I'll be back again with you on Wednesday. Until then, sweet dreams and bye bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>